It is not unusual to see men forget God's words and lose hope when God is working because what they want is not happening as soon as they want it. But the truth is that God's words never change. If he has said it, then he will do it. As it is written in the scriptures, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. God does not fail. He never fails. This scripture reiterates the importance of waiting for God. Some say that it is better to be slower than God than to be faster than him. It is vital that we learn to wait for God. It is expedient to allow him to do his work, believing that he is working even while we wait. The truth is that while we wait, God works. Sincerely, this is not just some cliche. It is a statement of fact that every believer should hold on to whether or not it seems like it. God works in us. He works through us and for us. It is something we must always hold on to. God cannot fail. He does not sleep, nor does he slumber. God is working even in the hardest of seasons. In the fiercest of storms, he is at work. He works all around the clock, making things work together for our good. So while we wait for God's appearance in the storm, just know that he is working. He is clearing every path. Sometimes, some people think that waiting for God means just waiting without doing anything. No, it does not mean wait and be idle, or wait and do things that are against God's will. It definitely does not mean wait and speak against God's promises. When Jesus told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power when the Holy Ghost will come upon them, what were they doing while they waited? That's right, they were praying. They kept on praying for days, declaring God's promises. Because they were fully expectant, they kept on proclaiming God's words. They were earnestly waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. It is the same way that we must earnestly wait on God to do great and mighty things in our lives. As we believe, we pray, we praise, we proclaim, and we are fully expectant. God never leaves his children, even in their worst moments. When we do wrong, God still stands by us. He will never leave you, nor forsake you as he has promised in his words. God is an ever-present helper in the time of your need. God is an ever-present hope, an ever-present provider, an ever-present protector, an ever-present helper. Glory, hallelujah. He is not a past helper. He is an ever, forever, present in all your times of need. Forever present. And the best part of these best things is the truth that his promises are ever sure. God will work for us, so we must wait for him. And when you keep on waiting for him, fully expecting and believing, he will show up in the most amazing ways. You will surely see the manifestation of the goodness that he has promised. You will experience the reality of the promises. While God works, we do not usually see what God is doing. In fact, you may even be tempted to think that he is not doing anything at all. The truth, however, is that all the while you wait, he is orchestrating his good works in your life. Even when we don't see it or feel it, he is working, so just know it. Hold unto that truth, cling to it, and let it be your hope that God is working for you even on the most quiet days. I'm not saying that your situation will change miraculously immediately or you'd wake up tomorrow to a full bed of roses without thorns. It just means that while you're patiently praying, praising and believing, things are turning around for your good. 
Regardless of the crossroads that you're at, or the temptations, trials, and tribulations that you face, God is working for you, so don't give up. All you need to do when you don't know where to turn is to trust. Not in man, but in God and his mighty miracle working power. As all relationships ebb and flow and we go through valley experience, God is still there with us. In that loud silence, he is there, and in the loud turmoil, he is there. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. Every one of us will be faced with these valleys because they are a part of the experience of life. But every time we go through these valleys, we need to know and also believe that God is there. God is in the midst of the silence. His approach might be different, and he may not do it in the way that you think he would. In fact, most times he doesn't. He may do the total opposite. Time is not in his book, and time cannot restrict or restrain him because he himself made time. God is never late. He is always in time to wake up your Lazarus. God is time himself. His wisdom is infinite. He is the Alpha and Omega that the scripture says. So when we stand in the present, God makes decisions for us based on the future. So even if you don't know why God is doing this or not this, stay in faith. Lamentations 3.25 The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks after him. As long as you wait for God, you will see his goodness. The prophet Isaiah says, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Even when you cannot hear his voice speaking, trust that his hands are working. Trust God's timing. He is never too late. There's a reason for the delay and a reason for all of our seasons. We must not get bitter and upset, but we must start to trust God in the middle of the season, despite how tough it may be. If you trust God from A, he will surely take you to Z. Do you know why you have to wait? What the wait does in you is much more important than where you're going. Even when you think that you are ready for that mighty blessing, God is still preparing you and is still working in you. It's a process, so trust God's timing. He has got a plan for you. Does that season seem so tough for you? God has got a plan. If you spend time in the presence of God and you hold on to the truth that he is walking with you and working with you, it overrides everything else that is going on in your life. He is going to take care of it in some way. We must stay in faith. So while we wait, we must say it out loud. God is working. His work did not just start at the moment you spoke. His work has started a long time ago. God is working in your life right now. Somehow, just make sure that you stay in faith and that you keep believing and let God work. As long as you believe that God is working, He will. God has heard your prayers. He is working in your situation. When you have prayed for other people, Know that you have no control over how long it takes. You must believe God and wait. Even when it feels like that kid is not changing or the finances are still the same, God is still faithful. You might or might not have to wait long, but whichever the case may be, God will come through. If you fix your attitude, you can enjoy your wait. How we wait is more important than what we're waiting for. If we're going to wait, we must wait with the right attitude. Let us live our best days, even while we're waiting, and not just when we have gotten what we want. That's what God wants for us. There's a right way to wait, and there's a wrong way to wait. While some people wait with so much anger, frustration, impatience, depression, we must wait in patience. Sometimes, while we wait, we can get tired and hope begins to wane in the waiting. The enemy begins to have a playground in your mind. 
resist him and stand your ground. No, I'm waiting here. At the end of the day, when it feels like his voice is quiet, trust that his hands are active and working effortlessly. His ability to work does not hinge on my perception of him. God knows better than we do. Thus, we must accept all of his ways whether it matches our time or not. He paints on the biggest canvas and he has never had a reason for a regret before. He is not too busy to hear you. While you were doing your thing, never one time has God failed and today won't be the day he starts. And you won't be the person that he starts with. Have hope. Hope is an expectation that something positive is going to happen to you. To have hope and expectancy is the Hebrew translation for the word wait. Wait with an expectant heart that God is going to bring this to pass. Wait with great expectations. The prophet Isaiah says, if you will wait upon the Lord the right way, he will renew your strength. You will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. This is what will happen to us if we wait the right way. Waiting the right way will ensure that we do not get burnt out, exhausted, or so impatient that we settle for something less than what God has promised us. It's easy to decide to give up, stop going to church, stop worshiping, stop staying in faith, but if we wait the right weight, we're going to be able to hold steady in the middle of our waiting and not fall off. Not quit church, not quit believing in God, and not give up on the promises. We have to learn how to wait with expectancy and also believe that while we're waiting for the promise to come to pass, God is with us. He is here for us and he is working behind the scenes for us. Your best days are yet to come. It will happen. Your best days are not behind you. Believe that the promise will come to pass and what is in front of you is much greater than what is behind you. What God is doing in you is much better than this season, so hold fast. Stand on his promise and do not quit. Expect a harvest. Your time will come. Your season of waiting is important. Don't get bitter while you're waiting for the promises of God to come to pass. While you're waiting for that family member to get back to church, while you're waiting for that loved one to give his life back to Jesus, while you're waiting for a house to sell, God says, wait with great expectations. Put your hope in the Lord. James chapter 5 verse 7 says that we're called to wait, like a farmer waits for his harvest. A farmer is confident. He's not stressed out. He is not worried. He knows that he has done his work. He has planted and done all the watering. It's just a matter of time before the harvest gets here. We must wait with that kind of confidence. You've been praying for a miracle, a breakthrough. Your loved one is sick. Your finances are in shambles. Your marriage is crumbling. As the clock is ticking, you're getting more desperate. You're praying for God to send you help now, not tomorrow, but now. But heaven seems silent. You feel like giving up. It seems like it's all over for you. It's in these difficult moments, the Bible gives us the most unexpected instructions. Give thanks in advance. As you wait, give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for you is that in this time of uncertainty and even doubt, where you may feel like you won't make it through, that you will give thanks to Him. We need to give thanks when it doesn't look like anything is changing. You might ask, even though my child is still sick? And the answer is yes. By faith, give thanks for the healing that is coming. Even though I don't have food on my table, 
Yes, give thanks for the Lord shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Even when I've been praying to have a child for years and the doctors are not hopeful for me? Yes, give thanks for the fruit of your womb. What is impossible with men is possible with God. God's way is that you trust him, believe that he will answer you. He expects us to give thanks in advance. It calls for trusting God's word and trusting that he is faithful no matter what. God wants us in faith to give thanks and trust that he will not fail. In Philippians 4, 6, his word says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, stop wasting your time and energy worrying about that problem. Spend your energy building your faith in God. Don't waste your time complaining about your troubles. The Israelites murmured and complained when they were in the wilderness. The Lord had brought them out from captivity in Egypt, but they felt that God had brought them from a bad situation to an even worse situation. They wanted the comfort of Egypt. They wasted their time complaining because they could not see the promised land. And that's how they missed their promise. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Remember that just like some of the Israelites, you could easily miss the answer to your prayer because of complaining, because of doubt. But when you thank God before you see your prayer answered, it shows God trust in him, just like Joshua and Caleb. It shows that you know that he's listening and he will make a way where there seems to be no way. It shows that you believe that there's nothing too hard for God and that he will give you victory. You see, giving thanks is your way of saying, God, I believe that you have heard me. God, I believe that you have answered me. A story is told of a centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant who was far away from where Jesus was. Jesus offered to go to where his servant was and heal him. But the centurion was a man of faith. He understood that Jesus had authority over his situation. He understood that Jesus was powerful and was able to heal his servant just by saying a word. In Matthew 8, 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Because he believed, he told Jesus that he didn't need to go where his servant was. The centurion understood that God's word is an authority, and when he speaks, his authority is final. He knew that his servant was healed. Will it be easy to say thank you when your situation is so difficult? Maybe not, but say thank you anyway. Will you want to cry out to God until you see your miracle? Yes, and there's nothing wrong with that because God is your father. But God is saying to you, that as you cry to him, remember to give him thanks. As you wait on him in prayer about a situation, give thanks. Our nature may be to panic. Human beings tend to worry, to be anxious about things that we're not able to control. So you have to speak to yourself. When your thoughts start drifting towards worry, you have to say, nope, I am not going to worry today. And what should you do instead? With thanksgiving, Present your request to God. That's what the Word of God says. Thank Him. Cast your burdens to Him. Thank Him because you even know what He will or will not do for you. Give thanks in advance. And in a miraculous way, something begins to change inside of you. When you start to thank Him for that job or that child or that house, the dark cloud hanging over your head starts to lift. As you give thanks in advance, your faith starts to get stronger. You start to hope again. 
you start to see God in a different light because thanking him in advance requires you to believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Thanking him in advance will require you to believe that he is faithful. And you know what? God cannot fail you. It's not his nature. He cannot deny himself. He is faithful through the ages. 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us that if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. He's not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. You can thank him in advance because as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, he will answer your prayers. He won't give you a stone when you ask for bread, and he won't give you a snake when you ask for a fish. So go ahead and thank him now before you see your answered prayer. Does it mean your answer will come instantly? Is it a way to arm twist God to give you what you want? Certainly not. In fact, many times God's timing is not our timing. He does his work on a different clock. You may have to wait a while, just like Abraham and Sarah waited for their son Isaac. They waited 25 years from the time God promised a son to Abraham to the time when Isaac was born. In this age of automation, convenience, fast food, instant this and instant that, waiting can be the most difficult thing. You wanna see results immediately. You may feel like God is taking too long, like he's not fully aware that you're running out of time. But you need to know that God is not running late on his appointment with you. He's never late. He can't be late because he's perfect in all his ways. In Isaiah 46:10, his word says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. His purpose for your life will come to pass, no matter how impossible it seems to you right now. His timing is perfect. See, God has the full picture. While we can only see this moment we're in, He is carefully putting the pieces of the puzzle in your life together. He knows the best time to bring that miracle to pass. He can see how and when it will fit perfectly in your life. Keep an attitude of gratitude and wait. Trust in his timing. He knows exactly what he's doing and hasn't forgotten about you. Mary and Martha called on Jesus when their brother Lazarus was sick. They waited for Jesus, who was not too far away from where they were. They watched their brother get more and more sick until Lazarus eventually died, and it looked like it was over for them. They thought Jesus was too late and they wrapped up their brother's body as was custom and put Lazarus in a tomb. A lot might have been going on in their minds. Why Jesus? Where were you when we called? Are we not important to you? All the while, Jesus was not far away. He was only a few miles from where Lazarus was, but he was waiting for the appointed time to heal Lazarus that God may be glorified. Jesus hadn't forgotten Martha and Mary's request. He wasn't sitting somewhere trying to make his schedule work so he could come see Lazarus. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. For us, when the situation looks impossible, we think it's also impossible for God. And like Mary, we're saying to the Lord, Lord, if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. Lord, if you would have been there, I wouldn't have lost my marriage or that job or that child. And just like Jesus was deeply moved by Mary's sorrow, he is deeply moved by your sorrow. He knows you've been praying and waiting. He knows you may be weary and almost giving up. In John 11:39, having given up, Martha had many reasons, excuses why the tomb should not be open. And they were valid reasons. The man had been dead four days. The tomb was going to have a foul smell. Jesus said to Mary, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And God is saying to you today that if you believe, if you keep thanking him, if you wait for his perfect timing, you will see his glory through your situation. 
He can make your dead situation live again. He will heal. He will restore. He will deliver. God is for you and not against you. He's fighting your battles. He's fighting for you. Sometimes it takes a while to see our prayers answered because there's a battle that has to be won in the heavens. Daniel, a faithful servant of God, had to wait for his answer. He prayed, but the Bible says his angel was delayed by a battle. The Bible records that the prince of the kingdom of Persia had detained the angel for 21 days. As Daniel kept praying, as he kept waiting, Satan tried to stop Daniel's answer from getting to him, but God sent angel Michael to fight the demons. And the end of it all, God won the battle for Daniel. You may have to wait because there is a battle in the heavens, but fear not. God will win the battle for you too. Keep praying, stay on your knees, wait on him until something happens. Thanking him always in advance, waiting for God's perfect timing. Many are the times we find ourselves blaming people for the things that happen to us. A day might not pass before you hear someone say, were it not for this person, I would have done this. I would be this. If so-and-so had not done this, then this would not have happened. We blame people because they kept us and made us miss the bus. We blame people because they did not tell us our kids were crossing the road, and so they got hit. We blame people for not reminding us the deadline was due, and so we submitted our assignments past time. We endlessly say if this person had done this, then this would or would not have happened. Now, is there any justification in that? The much the Bible says concerning this is telling us to be our brothers and sisters keepers. It does not tell us to rely on others to have our lives orderly. The Bible encourages us to take care of others, but it discourages us from making ourselves other people's responsibility. In Jeremiah 17.5, the Bible says, Cursed is the man who puts their trust in man, who draws strength from mere flesh. Why do you look up to a fellow man to do for you things you should be asking from God? If your trust is in man, the Bible calls you cursed. God is the one we should look up to, because whatever he says and does is not subject to human approval. If you are qualified by God, no man can disqualify you. If you are an appointed of God, no one can disappoint you. God is the only one with the final say over our lives, so it's Him we should seek counsel from. We should ask for advice from the Spirit of God. When we are in a dilemma and we need advice, we should rely on the Spirit of God to help us. Why do you wait for someone to compliment you? Why must you wait and feel for someone to say you are beautiful? In as much time when people say nice things about us, we feel good? That it is not where we should base our self-esteem on. Our focus should be on what God says about us. And he says that he created us in his own image and likeness. God says that you look like him. He says that you are wonderfully and beautifully made. Quit seeking approval from men. People will disappoint you. They will leave you bitter. They'll make you feel undeserving of anything good in this world. If you listen to the voices of the world, you will find yourself with a lot of unnecessary information. Do not rely on people. Stop depending on friends and family members. Make it a habit to have your ways guided by God, because only God can never forget, abandon, or forsake us. He says in Isaiah that even though a mother may forget a baby she has born, he will never forget us. Isaiah 49.15 People will love you when there is something in offer for them. They will be willing to help, but in exchange for something from you. Your boss might be willing to give you a promotion, but not before you give him some favors. Your lecturer might give you the high scores you crave, but it won't be for nothing. Your deskmate will reserve you a seat at the front row, but in return you will do something else for her. That's how people are. 
The there are no free things principle is what governs most human relationships. It might not apply to you, but it may apply to the people you interact with. There is real danger in relying on people. It is risky to put your trust in man, who is there today and is gone tomorrow, just like the grass of the field. Isaiah 2.22 says, Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why should you trust in a mere mortal, yet you have the privilege to trust in God, who is eternal? If it is God who establishes the plans of man, wouldn't it be wiser to trust him than to trust in fellow men? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the guards stand watch in vain. Psalm 127.1 This verse speaks on how useless it is to trust in men. They tell us that God is the only one who is capable of making our plans come to pass. If no man can control even a small percentage of their life, how about being entrusted with the lives of other people? If your trust is in men, you will be disappointed. If all you relay is on a mere mortal like you, you are in for a great shock. People will always be people. They will pretend to love us for the benefit that come with it. Other people will deny you certain opportunities simply because they don't like you. But if you trust in God and ask for anything by faith, then it will be done. God never disappoints. Psalm 37.25 says, I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Even when you're in a bad situation, trust in God. Do not rely on people to help you out. Put your total dependency on God. He will get you out of the situation. Psalm 9.10 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. People lie, people betray, people give up, people get tired, people lose interest, but God never does. He has never and he will never. He is not a man that he should lie. God does not betray. He does not tire at helping us out when we cry unto him. He can never lose interest in us. He is always on the lookout for us to ensure we are well. God is always there for us. He is the only one we should depend. Do not depend on anyone to cheer you up. Do not make anyone the source of your happiness. Do not wait for anyone to provide you with all what you need. Trust in God to give you the desires of your heart. Only God cannot take advantage of your needs. It is only God that cannot go spilling your secrets to anyone. It is only God who knows what he has in store for us. Therefore, if we trust in him, we have the assurance that no matter what happens, he always has our back. Psalm 121, 1-2 I lift up my eyes and look onto the mountains. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. So pick yourself up. Your worth is not dependent on what people say or do not say. You're not beautiful because someone said so, but because that is what God says. People might make you feel inferior. You can prove them wrong. People might despise you. You can make yourself feel good about you. People might try to bring you down. You can uplift your You can uplift yourself. You might not be so important to them, but to God you are of great value. People may not cheer you up when you need it the most, but think of God as your biggest cheerleader. When no one seems to notice the efforts you've made, cheer yourself up. Tell yourself that you can do all things through Christ. Why? Because the Bible says so. Because you are a child of God. Because you got your help from above. 
People might not take you to be special to them, but remember that you can make yourself feel special because that's how God sees you. He even has your name written on his palm just to show you how special you are. If you put your trust in man, you will be disappointed. When Jesus was arrested, he lacked even one friend that could stand by him during that period. Out of the 12 that had been with him during his ministry, none was willing. Peter, who had promised to always be with him, denied him in front of everyone. And that's the nature of human beings. To support us when things are going well, and when they're out of control, leaving us to solve them on our own. People will be there for you at first, but with time they get bored and leave. They will not hold your hand from the beginning to the end like God can. They will not supply your needs without problem like God can. Nobody will get you out of trouble countless times like God can. No one will give their lives up for you or that of their dear one for you like God did. Only few people, if any, will help you out of genuine concern. Put your trust in God. Stop relying on mere mortal human beings. Look up on the hills, for that is where your help will come from. If anything that you do, trust in God rather than relying on people. If you want to further your studies, trust in God that he will provide you with fees. If you want to start a business, trust in God that you will get the capital. If you are sick and seeking healing, take medicine and accompany them with prayer because God is your healer. Do not give people too much reverence in your life such that they take the place of God. Remember that they are creation just like yourself. It is the creator, not the creation, who is to be worshipped and trusted. The Bible says that those who put their trust in God shall never be disappointed. They shall. Stop seeking the validation and approval of men. Believe in whatever God says about you and your life. The praise and honor people give is temporary. Their happiness over your success is short-lived. They're only happy on the outside, but deep inside, they are genuinely happy. They will be happy when things are good, but disappear once we are in need of their help. If Jesus had relied on support from his disciples to make it through what had happened to him, he would have lost it. But since he relied on God, Jesus overcame. It was God that gave him the strength. That is what we should all desire. To call ourselves blessed even when people curse us. To always be happy even when people disappoint us. To say to ourselves, we can do it even when no one believes us. To rely fully on the promises of God. To feed directly of his word. Not to listen to the voices of the world. God wants us to stop relying on people and to trust in him alone. Start today. A. Failure is one thing that is inevitable in life. A popular quote says that if you've never failed, then you've never tried anything new. We actually don't just fail doing new stuff. We can also fail as we do things we've done for years. Think about the perfect driver who knows all the city roads, but one day they miss a sign and cause an accident. That perfect chef that prepares the most delicious meals but one day they get the salt measurement wrong. All I am saying is failure is something we encounter on our day-to-day -day lives. We fail in our relationships with others. We fail in our marriages. We fail in our studies. We fail in keeping the promises we make to our loved ones. We fail even the people who believe in us most. We fail in our decision making and that is not just it. We also fail in our relationship with God. Have you ever sat down and thought how badly you've messed up? You're like, this is the worst I could ever do as a believer. 
You are even ashamed to go before God in prayer and repent. You do not know where to begin. You are at a loss at what to pray for and how to do it. Well, it's not a new thing. The Bible has many accounts of people who failed God, but they still made up and picked themselves up. They regained their balance in walking with Christ. It was one fine evening dining with Christ on his last free night on earth. Jesus and his disciples were having the last supper and out of nowhere, Jesus told them that one of them would betray him. That was something they could not have thought of, especially not when they were comfortably having a feast to mark an important celebration. They began questioning who it was and when Jesus said it was one of them, Peter went ahead to say that he could never do it. He swore to Jesus that he would never betray him and that he would be with him wherever he went. Jesus replied that that night, before the cock crowed, Peter would deny him three times. And on the same night, Jesus got arrested and on questioning Peter denied knowing him or being his follower for three times, just as Jesus had prophesied. Immediately, the cock crowed Jesus looked at Peter, and when Peter saw him, he realized what he had done. He remembered the prophecy Jesus had made at the dinner table and realized that he had broken the vow. He went out and cried bitterly. Peter failed. He broke the vow he had made to Jesus. But that did not stop him from continuing with the mission of Christ with so much zeal. That did not make him any less of an apostle. Once he realized what he had done, he showed remorse for this action and got up on his feet again to fight for his faith. And just like Peter, sometimes we make genuine promises. We give our honest views about something. We commit ourselves to the Christian course with the honest belief that things will be as we have planned them. Sometimes we fail and it is not intentional. Just like Peter, we mean it when we say, Lord, I accept you today. I promise to leave my old life and start afresh in you. But some moments later, we find ourselves having done what we promised God we wouldn't do. In such a situation, one might feel very low, but we should not give up. There is always a second and third and infinite number of chances to make it up to God. We should not give up in the strive to live lives worth of the calling of Christ just because we have missed once. It is not just in the New Testament where believers made mistakes in their lives. David was a king in Israel. The Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? No. Did he fail God at some point? Yes, but failure did not stop him from putting the interest of God at heart. He still pursued the knowledge of God and sought to please him. Despite the fact that he had committed adultery and organized the killing of an innocent man at some point in his life, he did not let his failure weigh him down. He used it as an opportunity to draw closer to God and repent and make stronger his relationship with him. When you think you have screwed up real bad, do not give up on your faith. Do not say to yourself, this salvation thing is hard. I don't think I can do it. Instead, use it as an opportunity to build yourself in faith. Don't let failure stop you from pleasing God. Sometimes it's the devil who uses failure to make us lose our stand in salvation. Strengthen yourself like David Say to yourself, each time you feel like giving up, I've got a thing going and I'm not letting it go. Do not give up on salvation just because you messed up one time. God is faithful enough to take you through all that you are facing. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Be confident in this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. The time we realize we have made a mistake, we should not shy away from him. We should go to him and with our hearts as broken as they are and be honest with him as we present our case before him. Failure is not the end. It is just the closure of one phase and the start of another, a more glorious one. When Hagar got a baby by Abraham, she got full of herself. She started despising Hannah. She passed on that attitude to her son, Ishmael. 
Ishmael adapted it and grew up disrespecting his brother Isaac. Now when Sarah had had enough of her, she had them chased away into the desert. Now Hagar was at one point eating life from a silver spoon. She had a son who had a chance to become Abraham's heir. She had everything she could have needed. She became proud and that marked the beginning of her fall up to the point that Abraham chased her and her son into the desert. The desert is a very dry place. Hagar and Ishmael got very thirsty and tired. They were staring at death for there seemed no source of water nearby. But God did not see Hagar as a woman who had messed up her life. When God looked down at Hagar in the desert, he did not see her as someone going through what she had deserved for despising Sarah. She saw a mother of generations. He looked at her with compassionate eyes. He caused her to see a well from where she drew water and saved her life and that of her son. When we think we have failed so hard that God has no more chance for us, that is the time God wants us most. He picks us up and remolds us. He gives us the water that we need to keep going. When our situations have turned upside down and we cannot understand what's going on anymore, God comes and whispers to us, It's alright child, I got this under control. We may fail God, but he will never fail us. We might wander away from Him into useless wastelands, but He will wait for us to return. Our relationship with Him is explained in the parable of the prodigal son. The son thought he had made it in life when he reached an age where he could inherit his share of his father's wealth. His father, as loving as he was, gave him the share. The son went out to a faraway land where he squandered the inheritance on women and luxurious lifestyle. When it was finished, he survived on feeding pigs and feeding on their food too, until one day he remembered of how the servants in his father's house had more than enough to eat. He thought, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The Bible records what happened once the son returned to his father's house. The father forgave him and welcomed him home. He had him clothed in decent clothes and threw a party for him. That is how God waits upon us to go back to him once we have realized our mistake. His hands are always open, ready to receive us. He is a loving father who can never give up on his children. All he wants us to do is repent and go back to him and he will receive us warmly into his embrace. Failure is in all aspects of life, but it is not the end of everything. Whatever thing you have been trying to do with little success, do not give up. Our lives are filled with problems and troubles. The hatred of the world is disheartening. Sometimes you may be mocked and despised for standing strong for the kingdom. You are abused and called all sorts of names because you believe in Jesus Christ. You feel like giving up. You are tired. It is not abnormal. Even a great prophet like Elijah had his low moment when he felt like giving up. He said, Lord, this is enough. Just take me to glory. I'm ready to give up. He felt desperate and worn out. He also felt all alone, for he thought he was the only one still standing for God. He was ready to give up. Even Jeremiah felt the same way. His isolated life had become too much to bear. He told God, Lord, I think I'll quit the ministry and get a little motel by the roadside and rest. He felt like giving up, but these two great men of God did not give up. Like David, they held on to the thing God had begun inside them. Sometimes we are put into tests through failure. We begin a business and it does not pick up. God wants us to see whether we will still praise Him. We work hard for something and it does not come out as planned. That might be a test God is putting us through. He wants to see whether we still trust in Him. He wants to see whether we still believe in His power. God promised Abraham and Sarah a son when they were 75 and 65 years of age respectively. Yet, they had to wait for 25 years before the child was born. 
We kept on trying. Sarah's failure to conceive during those trial years did not make them doubt the promise of God. They still held on to what God had said. If God called you to be a preacher among nations, no matter how many times you try and fail, do not give up. If God showed you through a vision that one day you will be working for a big organization, no matter how many times you fail the interview, do not give up. Failure is just a part of the journey. It is neither the destination nor is it the end. Pick yourself once more and give it one more try. This time round, start on a high note of faith. This time round, stand on what God said. Failure might be inevitable, but quitting is never an option. Do not give up. Keep trying. I have never met a single human being who has not felt worry. We all worry, young and old alike. The young person worries about not making friends. They worry about passing or failing exams. They worry about what people think about them. The older person worries for their children, their business, their job, paying bills about their goals and aspirations. We all tend to worry about situations that we feel we have no control over. Worry is one of the most stubborn, nagging feelings we experience almost on a daily basis. Worry will confuse you, weigh you down, reduce you to feelings of defeat. Worry reminds you of your shortcomings and all the reasons why things won't work out as you've planned. It seems to me that everyday life provides opportunities, circumstances where we have to choose whether to worry or not. And I often ask myself, is this how we were meant to live? Is this God's intention for us? Well, the answer is one emphatic no. In His Word, God has given us wisdom, promises, and His assurance to help us through every one of our situations. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9, he reminds us that there is nothing new under the sun. This is wisdom. There's no need to panic or worry because whatever you're going through now, someone else has gone through before. There are thousands of promises in his word and it's up to you and I to believe what he says. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, we are instructed to keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what we have because God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. Don't let the enemy lie to you. God will never desert you. He's fighting your battles. And there are times we will feel unworthy of God's help. We feel we don't have the right to ask Him for help. But God does not leave us when we fall or fail. He has promised to stay with us. There are times He seems far away, but no matter how alone you feel, He is right there with you. When we believe what He has promised, worry will have no place inside of us. In Psalms 55 verse 22, the Bible says, Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. He has assured us that there is nothing too hard for him. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27 And the Lord says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? The Bible records a day when the disciples experienced worry in Mark chapter 4 verse 35 to 41. After a long day of teaching crowds of people, Jesus called his disciples to get away with him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And often, it's the same for us. God leads us into situations and calls us to get to the other side of the sea. And it always starts out with excitement. We feel we're connecting with God and we enjoy Him leading us to a new place, a new horizon, a new and assumedly better place, a place of rest. But there can be storms on the way to the place God is leading us. God may promise you a promotion at work and you feel excited. Then you start going through trials and tribulations from the same workplace and your promotion seems nowhere in sight. Then the worry sets in. You can't eat properly, can't sleep well, and you are worried sick about keeping your job, let alone getting that promotion. Or maybe God promised you a child and you felt so excited, but before the child comes, you go through one disappointment after the other. Fibroids, miscarriages, several negative reports from doctors, 
things begin to get shaky when the storms of life rock the boat. The disciples who knew the sea and its dangers all too well suddenly realized that things were not looking good. The waves were now high and water was getting into their boats, so much that the boats were almost full of water. Some of the disciples were seasoned fishermen and they understand the water. They weren't panicking without a just cause. They were used to the waters and they knew and could see that the storm was one to worry about. They had every reason to worry about their situation. In the same way, we too look at our situations, we analyze them from every angle and we start to see that without a shadow of doubt, things are not looking good for us. At this point, worry and fear set in and our worries are not unrealistic. By our own strength, our troubles are impossible to overcome. But God is not calling us to overcome our challenges in our own strength. He's not calling us to stop worrying. He's calling us to trust Him and trust in His power to calm the storms of life. And all the while, like the disciples, you may feel like God is asleep. You feel like He doesn't care about what's going on around you. But He does care. He's just not as worried as you are about the situation because he knows the end from the beginning. Jesus asked his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? There is no way faith and worry can coexist. One has to make room for the other and you have to choose which one will win the battle in your mind. Hey, listen. Abraham and Sarah had a very good reason to worry. They were very old. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 11, it is written that Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. But in Genesis chapter 18 verse 14, God asks Abraham, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. At some point, Abraham and Sarah started to worry. They started to feel that God had taken too long and perhaps he wasn't going to give them a son through Sarah's womb. And Sarah tried to solve her problem in her own way. Because in her understanding, from what she could see, time was not on her side and she took matters in her own hands. And don't we do the same in our circumstances? We start to wonder if God really promised us that He'd give us that promotion or bring that husband or pay off our debt. We start to question whether God exists and if He does, is He aware of everything we're going through? We start to doubt and when we doubt, worry sets in. When worry sets in, we panic and make all the wrong decisions that may affect generations to come. I know, the feelings of worry can be so strong. It can be hard to wait on God. But, child of God, God is not ignoring the fact that your situation seems impossible. He's not saying that He can't see how different your circumstance is. He is calling us to see how big He is. He is calling us to believe that He cares and that He is powerful enough to help you overcome. He can turn your situation around in ways that you can't even imagine. So don't worry, he says. See, there is no limitation to our God. He is above and beyond what our minds can even grasp or imagine. Many terrible things are happening in our world today and some of us feel trapped by our impossible situations. Many of us are suffering with anxiety disorders and not even medication is enough to give us relief. But today, Jesus is speaking to your life, to your storm, and he says, peace, be still, not as the world gives you. This is not positive thinking. This is not faking it till you make it. This is about God's limitless ability to do the impossible. This is about you having faith as small as a mustard seed, and God will move that mountain. When you're in trouble or going through a difficult storm, it's very easy for you to lose your faith. You may look around and start to wonder if God still cares, but faith calls you to be sure of what you hope for, to believe for things you haven't seen. You'll have to trust Him in the middle of your storm. Forget all you know and give your worries to the Lord. 
1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. To cast your cares is not to casually give them to him, but to cast it is to literally throw your cares to God. It's time to throw that worry off. It's time to believe that God will make all things work for your good. And where your faith is low, where you feel that you can't believe, ask God to help your unbelief. He's ready to help you have faith. Whatever you do, don't give up. Don't worry. You have to fight that worry. Fight for your peace. Fight for your life. In the name of Jesus, replace those negative thoughts with thoughts of faith because God has good thoughts towards you to give you a hope and a future. Speak to that storm in the name of Jesus Christ and he will calm that storm. Give him full control and let him do the heavy lifting. Let him fight your battles. The word of God says to you and I, don't worry. Which means it's a choice. It's up to you and I to choose whether to waste our time and energy worrying or do everything we can to build faith in God. Don't worry. After all, Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single R to your life? Worrying doesn't solve anything. If anything, it makes things worse. Don't worry. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says to you and I, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about what you will wear. Do not be anxious for anything. And anything means anything. Don't worry. Philippians chapter 4, verse 67. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Refuse to worry. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Don't worry. Replace your thoughts or worry with the truth of God. When God calls you to walk on the water, gather your courage and walk. Trust Him. If God says, he will get you to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, then he will. Trust him. Whatever you may face today, don't worry. Refuse to worry, and you will see his power working in your life. After all, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us.